Chapter Thirteen of the Englishwoman in America by Isabella Lucy Bird, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter Thirteen, one of the sights of Quebec, to me decidedly the most interesting one, was the House of Assembly. The legislature were burned out of their house at Montreal, and more recently out of a very handsome one at Quebec. It is to be hoped this august body will be more fortunate at Toronto, the present place of meeting. The temporary place of sitting at Quebec seemed to me more perfectly adapted for the purposes of hearing, seeing, and speaking. It is a spacious apartment, with deep galleries, which hold about five hundred round it, which were to Quebec what the opera and the club-houses are to London. In fact, these galleries were crowded every night, and certainly, when I was there, fully one half of their occupants were ladies, who could see and be seen. The presence of ladies may have an effect in preventing the use of very intemperate language, and though it is maliciously said that some of the younger members speak more for the galleries than the house, and though some gallant individual may occasionally step upstairs to restore a truant handkerchief or boa to the fair owner, the distractions caused by their presence are very inconsiderable, and the arrangements for their comfort are a great reflection upon the miserable, latticed hole to which lady listeners are condemned in the English House of Commons. I must remark also that the house was well warmed and ventilated, without the aid of alternating siricos and north winds. The speaker's chair, on a dais and covered with a canopy, was facing us, in which reclined the speaker in his robes. In front of him was a table, at which sat two black-robed clerks, and on which a huge mace reposed, and behind him was the reporter's gallery, where the gentlemen of the press seemed to be most comfortably accommodated. There was a large open space in front of this table, extending to the bar, at which were seated the messengers of the house, and the sergeant-at-arms with his sword. On either side of this open space were four rows of handsome desks, and Morocco seats, to accommodate two members each, who sat as most amiable Gemini. The floor was richly carpeted, and the desk covered with crimson cloth, and, with the well-managed flood of light, the room was very complete. The Canadian Constitution is as nearly a transcript of our own as anything colonial can be. The Governor can do no wrong. He must have a responsible cabinet taken from the members of the legislature, his administration must have a working majority, as in England, and he must bow to public opinion by changing his advisers, when the representatives of the people lose confidence in the government. The Legislative Council represents our House of Peers, and the Legislative Assembly, or Provincial Parliament, our House of Commons. The Upper House is appointed by the Crown, under the advice of the Ministry of the Day, but as a clamour has been raised against it as yielding too readily to the demands of the lower house, a measure has been brought in for making its members elective for a term of years. If this change were carried, coupled with others on which it would not interest the English reader to dwell, it would bring about an approximation of the Canadian Constitution to that of the United States. On one night on which I had the pleasure of attending the house, the subject under discussion was the Romish holidays, as connected with certain mercantile transactions. It sounds dry enough, but as the debate was turned into an extremely interesting religious discussion, it was well worth hearing, and the crowded galleries remained in a state of quiescence. Mr. Hinks, the late Premier, was speaking when we went in. He is by no means eloquent, but very pointed in his observations, and there is an amount of logical sequence in his speaking which is worthy of imitation elsewhere. He is a remarkable man, and will probably play a prominent part in the future political history of Canada. He is the son of a Presbyterian minister at Cork, and emigrated to Toronto in 1832. During Lord Durham's administration he became editor of the Examiner newspaper, and entered the Parliament of the United Provinces in 1841. He afterwards filled the important position of Inspector-General of Finances, and finally became Prime Minister. His administration was, however, overturned early in 1854, and sundry grave charges were brought against him. He spoke in favour of abolition of the privileges conceded to Romish holidays, and was followed by several French Canadians, two of them of the Rogue Party, who spoke against the measure, one of them so eloquently as to remind me of the historical days of the Girondists. 
Mr. Lyon Mackenzie, who led the rebellion, which was so happily checked at Toronto, and narrowly escaped condemned punishment, followed and diverged from the question of promissory notes to the Russian war and other subjects, and when loud cries of question, question, order, order arose, he tore up his notes, and sat down abruptly in a most theatrical manner, amid bursts of laughter from both floor and galleries, for he appears to be the privileged buffoon of the house. The appearance of the house is rather imposing, the members behave with extraordinary decorum, and to people accustomed to the noises and unseemly interruptions which characterize the British House of Commons, the silence and order of the Canadian House are very agreeable. The members seemed to give full attention to the debate, very few were writing, and none were reading anything except parliamentary papers, and no speaker was interrupted except on one occasion. There was extremely little walking about but I observed one gentleman, a notorious exquisite, cross the floor several times, apparently with no other object than that of displaying his fine person in bowing profoundly to the speaker. The gentlemanly appearance of the members, taken altogether, did not escape my notice. Sir Alan McNabb, the present Premier, is the head of a coalition ministry. Fortunately, it is not necessary to offer any remarks upon its policy, and Canada, following the example of the mother country, submits quietly to a coalition. The opposition, which is formed of the Liberal Party, is seated opposite the government, fronted by Mr. Lyon Mackenzie, who gives a wavering adherence to every party in secession, and is often indignantly disavowed by all. The Liberals of Upper Canada are ably led by Mr. George Brown, who excels in a highly lucid, powerful, and perspicuous course of reasoning, which cannot fail to produce an effect. Then there is the Rouge Party, led by the member for Montreal, which is principally composed of very versatile and enthusiastic Frenchmen, of rather indefinite opinions and aims, professing a creed which appears a curious compound of republicanism and rationalism. The word latitudinarianism defines it best. There are one hundred and thirty members, divided into numerous ists and ites. Most of the members for Lower Canada are French, and consequently the Romish party is a very powerful one in the House. Taken as a whole, the members are loyal, and have proved their attachment to England by a vote of twenty thousand pounds for the Patriotic Fund. I think that all who are in the habit of reading the debates will allow that the speaking in the House will bear comparison with that in our House of Commons, and if some of the younger members, in attempting the sublime, occasionally attain the ridiculous, and mistake extravagance of expression for greatness of thought, these are faults which time and criticism will remedy. Canada is a great and prosperous country, and its legislative assembly is very creditable to so young a community. Bribery, corruption, and place-hunting are alleged against this body, but as these vices are largely developed in England, it would be bad taste to remark upon them, particularly as the most ardent correctors of abuses now reluctantly allow that they are inseparable from popular assemblies. It is needless to speak of the upper house, which, as has been sarcastically remarked of our house of peers, is merely a high court of registry. It remains to be seen whether an elective chamber would possess a greater vitality and independence. The Speaker of the Legislative Assembly is a Frenchman, and French and English are used indiscriminately in debate. Parliamentary notices and papers are also printed in both languages. It was a cold, gloomy October morning, a cold east wind rustled the russet leaves, and a heavy, dry fog enveloped Point Diamond, when I left the bustle of Quebec for a quiet drive to Montmorency in a light wagon, with a very spirited little horse, a young lady acting as charioteer. The little animal was very impetuous, and rattled down the steep, crowded streets of Quebec, at a pace which threatened to entangle our wheels with those of numerous carts driven by apathetic habitants, who were perfectly indifferent to the admonitions prenez gare and place aux dames delivered in beseeching tomes we passed down a steep street and through palace gate into the district of st roch teeming with irish and dirt for i fear it is a fact that wherever you have the first you invariably have the last beyond this there was a space covered with mud and sawdust where two habitants were furiously quarrelling one sprang upon the other like a hyena, knocked him down, and then attempted to bite and strangle him, amid the applause of numerous spectators. 
Leaving Quebec behind, we drove for seven miles along a road in sight of the lesser branch of the St. Lawrence, which has, on the other side, the green and fertile island of Orléans. The houses along this road are so numerous as to present the appearance of a village the whole way. Frenchmen, who arrive here in summer, can scarcely believe that they are not in their own sunny land. The external characteristics of the country are so exactly similar. These dwellings are large, whitewashed, and many-windowed, and are always surrounded with balconies. The doors are reached by flights of steps, in order that they may be above the level of the snow in winter. The rooms are clean, but large and desolate-looking, and are generally ornamented with caricatures of the Virgin and uncouth representations of miracles. The women dress in the French style, and wear large straw hats out of doors, which were the source of constant disappointments to me, for I always expected to see a young, if not a pretty, face under the broad brim, and these females were remarkably ill-favoured, their complexions hardened, wrinkled, and bronzed, from the effects of hard toil and the extremes of heat and cold. I heard the hum of spinning-wheels from many of the houses, for these industrious women spin their household linen, and the grey homespun in which the men are clothed. The furniture is antique, and made of oak, and looks as if it had been handed down from generation to generation. The men, largely assisted by the females, cultivate small plots of ground, and totally disregard all modern improvements. These French towns and villages improve but little. Popery, that great antidote to social progress, is the creed universally professed, and generally the only building of any pretensions is a large Romish church, with two lofty spires of polished tin. Education is not much prized. The desires of the simple habitants are limited to the attainment of a competence for life, and this their rudely tilled farms supply them with. Few emigrants make this part of Canada even a temporary resting place. The severity of the climate, the language, the religion, and the laws are all against them. Hence, though a professor of a purer faith may well blush to confess it, the vices which emigrants bring with them are unknown. These peasants are among the most harmless people under the sun. They are moral, sober, and contented, and zealous in the observances of their erroneous creed. Their children divide the land, and as each prefers a piece of soil adjoining the road or river, strips of soil may occasionally be seen only a few yards in width. They strive after happiness rather than advancement, and who shall say that they are unsuccessful in their aim? As their fathers lived, so they live. Each generation has the simplicity and superstition of the preceding one. In the autumn they gather in their scanty harvest, and in the long winter they spin and dance round their stove-sides. On Sundays and saints' days they assemble in crowds in their churches, dressed in the style of a hundred years since. Their wants and wishes are few, their manners are courteous and unsuspicious, they hold their faith with a blind and unpleasant credulity, and on summer evenings sing the songs of France as their fathers sang them in bygone days on the smiling banks of the rushing Rhone. The road along which the dwellings of these small farmers lie is macadamized, and occasionally a cross stands by the roadside, at which devotees may be seen to prostrate themselves. There is a quiet, lethargic, old-world air about the country, contrasting strangely with the bustling, hurrying, restless progress of Upper Canada. Though the condition of the habitants is extremely unprofitable to themselves, it affords a short rest to the thinking and observing faculties of the stranger, overstrained as they are with taking in and contemplating the railroad progress of things in the new world. While we admire and wonder at the vast material progress of western Canada and the northwestern states of the Union, considerations fraught with alarm will force themselves upon us. We think that great progress is being made in England, but without having travelled in America, it is scarcely possible to believe what the Anglo-Saxon race is performing upon a new soil. In America we do not meet with factory operatives, seamstresses, or clerks overworked and underpaid, toiling their lives away in order to keep body and soul together. But we have people of all classes who could obtain competence, and often affluence, by moderate exertions, working harder than slaves, sacrificing home enjoyments, pleasure, and health itself to the one desire of the acquisition of wealth. Daring speculations fail, the struggle in unnatural competition with men of large capital, or dishonourable dealings, wears out at last the overtasked frame. Life is spent in a whirl, 
death summons them and finds them unprepared. Everybody who has any settled business is overworked. Voices of men crying for relaxation are heard from every quarter, yet none dare to pause in this race which they so madly run, in which happiness and mental and bodily health are among the least of their considerations. All are spurred on by the real or imaginary necessities of their position, driven along their headlong course by avarice, ambition, or eager competition. The falls of Montmorency, which we reached after a drive of eight miles, are beautiful in the extreme, and as the day was too cold for picnic parties, we had them all to ourselves. There is no great body of water, but the river takes an unbroken leap of two hundred and eighty feet from a black, narrow gorge. The scathed black cliffs descend in one sweep to the St. Lawrence, in fine contrast to the snowy whiteness of the fall. Montmorency gave me a greater sensation of pleasure than Niagara. There are no mills, museums, guides, or curiosity shops. Whatever there is of beauty bears the fair impress of its creator's hand, and if these falls are beautiful on a late October day, when a chill east wind was howling through leafless trees, looming through a cold grey fog, what must they be in the burst of spring, or the glowing luxuriance of summer? We drove back for some distance, and entered a small cabaret, where some women were diligently engaged in spinning, and some men were superintending with intense interest the preparation of some soup maigre. Their patois was scarcely intelligible, and a boy whom we took as our guide spoke no English. After encountering some high fences and swampy ground, we came to a narrow, rocky pathway in a wood, with bright green, moss-covered trees, stones, and earth. On descending a rocky bank we came to the natural staircase, where the rapid Montmorency forces its way through a bed of limestone, the broken but extremely regular appearance of the layers being very much like wide steps. The scene at this place is wildly beautiful. The river, frequently only a few feet in width, sometimes foams furiously along between precipices covered with trees, and bearing the marks of years of attrition, then buries itself in dark gulfs, or rests quiescent for a moment in still black pools, before it reaches its final leap. The day before I left Quebec I went to the romantic falls of Lorette, about thirteen miles from the city. It was a beauteous day. I should have called it oppressively warm, but that the air was fanned by a cool west wind. The Indian summer had come at last. The sagamores of the tribes had lighted their council fires on the western prairies. What would we not give for such a season? It is the rekindling of summer, but without its heat. It is autumn in its glories, but without its gloom. The air is soft like the breath of May. Everything is veiled in a soft, pure haze, and the sky is of a faint and misty blue. A mysterious fascination seemed to bind us to St. Rock, for we kept missing our way and getting into streams as black as sticks. But at length the city of Quebec, with its green glasses and frowning battlements, was left behind, and we drove through flat country abounding in old stone dwelling-houses, old farms, and large fields of stubble. We neared the blue hills, and put up our horses in the Indian village of Lorette. Beautiful Lorette! I must not describe, for I cannot, how its river escapes from under the romantic bridge in a broad sheet of milk-white foam, and then, contracted between sullen barriers of rock, seeks the deep shade of the pine-clad precipices, and hastens to lose itself there. It is perfection, and beauty, and peace, and the rocky walks upon its forest-covered crags might be in Switzerland. Being deserted by the gentlemen of the party, my fair young companion and I found our way to Lorette, which is a large village built by government for the Indians, but by intermarrying with the French they have lost nearly all their distinctive characteristics, and the next generation will not even speak the Indian language. Here, as in every village in Lower Canada, there is a large Romish church, ornamented with gaudy paintings. We visited some of the squaws, who wear the Indian dress, and we made a few purchases. We were afterwards beset by Indian boys with bows and arrows of clumsy construction, but they took excellent aim, incited by the reward of coppers which we offered to them. It is grievous to see the remnants of an ancient race in such a degraded state, the more so as I believe that there is no intellectual inferiority as an obstacle to their improvement." I saw some drawings by an Indian youth which evinced considerable talent. 
one in particular, a likeness of Lord Elgin, was admirably executed. I have understood that there is scarcely a greater difference between these half-breeds and the warlike tribes of Central America than between them and the Christian Indians of the Red River settlements. There are about fourteen thousand Indians in Canada, few of them in a state of great poverty, for they possess annuities arriving from the sale of their lands. They have no incentive to exertion, and spend their time in shooting, fishing, and drinking spirits in taverns, where they speedily acquire the vices of the white men without their habits of industry and enterprise. They have no idols, and seldom enter into hostile opposition to Christianity, readily exchanging the worship of the great spirit for its tenets as far as convenient. It is very difficult, however, to arouse them to a sense of sin, or to any idea of the importance of the world to come but at the same time in no part of the world have missionary labors been more blessed than at the red river settlements great changes have passed before their eyes year as it succeeds year sees them driven farther west as their hunting grounds are absorbed by the insatiate white races the twang of the indian bow and the sharp report of the indian rifle are exchanged for the clink of the lumberer's axe and the glang of the sturdy settler the corn waves in luxuriant crops over land once covered with the forest haunts of the moose, and the waters of lakes over which the red man paddled in his bark canoe are now ploughed by crowded steamers. Where the bark dwellings of his father stood, the locomotive darts away on its iron road, and the helpless Indian looks on aghast at the power and resources of the pale-faced invaders of his soil. The boat by which I was to leave Quebec was to sail on the afternoon of the day on which I visited Lorette, but was detained till the evening by the postmaster-general, when a heavy fog came on, which prevented its departure till the next morning. The smallpox had broken out in the city, and rumours of cholera had reached and alarmed the gay inhabitants of St. Louis. I never saw terror so unrestrainedly developed as among some ladies on hearing of the return of the pestilence. One of them went into hysterics, and became so seriously ill that it was considered necessary for her to leave Quebec on the same evening. In consequence of the delay of the boat, it was on a Sunday morning that I bade adieu to Quebec. I had never travelled on a Sunday before, and should not have done so on this occasion had it not been a matter of necessity. I am happy to state that no boats run on the St. Lawrence on the Sabbath, and the enforced sailing of the John Munn caused a great deal of grumbling among the stewards and crew. The streets were thronged with people going early to Mass, and to a special service held to avert the heavy judgments which it was feared were impending over the city. The boat was full, and many persons who were flying from the cholera had slept on board. I took a regretful farewell of my friends, and with them of the beautiful Quebec. I had met with much of kindness and hospitality, but still I must confess that the excessive gaiety and bustle of the city exercise a depressing influence. People appear absorbed by the fleeting pleasures of the hour. The attractions of this life seem to overbalance the importance of the life to come, and among the poor there is a large amount of sin and sorrow. Too many who enter into the world without a blessing, and depart from it without a hope." The bright sun of the Indian summer poured down its flood of light upon the castled steep, and a faint blue mist was diffused over the scene of beauty. Long undulating lines showed where the blue hills rose above the green island of Orléans, and slept in the haze of that gorgeous season. Not a breath of wind stirred the heavy folds of the flag of England on the citadel, or ruffled the sleeping St. Lawrence, or the shadows of the countless ships on its surface, and the chimes of the bells of the Romish churches floated gently over the water. Such a morning as I have seldom seen, and Quebec lay basking in beauty. Surely that morning sun shone upon no fairer city. The genial rays of that autumn sun were typical of the warm, kind hearts I was leaving behind, who had welcomed a stranger to their hospitable homes, and as the bell rang and the paddles revolved in the still deep water, a feeling of sorrow came over my heart when I reflected that the friendly voices might never again sound in my ear, and that the sunshine which was then glittering upon the fortress city might, to my eyes, glitter upon it no more. The John Munn was a very handsome boat, fitted up with that prodigality which I have elsewhere described as characteristic of the American steamers, 
but in the course of investigation I came upon the steerage, or that part of the middle floor which is devoted to the poorer class of immigrants, of whom five hundred had landed at Quebec only the day before. The spectacle here was extremely annoying, for men, women, and children were crowded together in an ill-ventilated space, with kettles, saucepans, blankets, bedding, and large blue boxes. There was a bar for the sale of spirits, which, I fear, was very much frequented, for towards night there were sounds of swearing, fighting, and scuffling, proceeding from this objectionable locality. A day-boat was such a rare occurrence, that some of the citizens of Quebec took the journey merely to make acquaintance with the beauties of their own river. We passed the heights of Abraham, and Wolfe's Cove, famous in history, wooded slopes and beautiful villas, the Chaudière River, and its pine-hung banks, but I was so ill that even the beauty of the St. Lawrence could not detain me in the saloon, and I went down into the ladies' cabin, where I spent the rest of the day on a sofa wrapped in blankets. A good many of the ladies came downstairs to avoid some quadrilles which a French-Canadian lady was playing, and a friend of mine, Colonel P., having told some one that I had had the cholera, there was a good deal of mysterious buzzing in consequence, of which I only heard a few observations, such as, how very imprudent, how very wrong to come into a public conveyance, just as we were trying to leave it behind, too. But I was too ill to be amused, even when one lady went so far as to remove the blanket to look at my face. There was a very pale and nervous-looking young lady lying on a sofa opposite, staring fixedly at me. Suddenly she got up, and asked me if I were very ill. I replied that I had been so. "'She's had the cholera, poor thing,' the stewardess unfortunately observed. "'The cholera,' she said, with an affrighted look, and hastily putting on her bonnet, vanished from the cabin, and never came down again. She had left Quebec because of the cholera, having previously made inquiries as to whether any one had died of it in the John Munn, and now, being brought, as she fancied, into contact with it, her imagination was so strongly affected that she was soon taken seriously ill, and brandy and laudanum were in requisition. So great was the fear of contagion, that though the bolt was so full that many people had to sleep on sofas, no one would share a state-room with me. We were delayed by fog, and did not reach Montreal till one in the morning. I found Montreal as warm and damp as it had been cold and bracing on my first visit, but the air was not warmer than the welcome which I received. Kind and tempting was the invitation to prolong my stay at the sea-house. Enticing was the prospect offered me of a visit to a seigneury on the Ottawa, and it was with very great reluctance, after a sojourn of only one day, I left this abode of refinement and hospitality, and the valued friends who had received me with so much kindness, for a tedious journey to New York." I left the sea-house at five o'clock on the last day of October, so ill that I could scarcely speak or stand. It was pitch dark, and the rain was pouring in torrents. The high wind blew out the lamp which was held at the door, an unpropitious commencement of a journey. Something was wrong with the harness, the uncouth vehicle was nearly upset backwards, the steam ferry was the height of gloom, heated to a stifling extent, and full of people with oilskin coats and dripping umbrellas. We crossed the rushing St. Lawrence, just as the yellow gaslights of Montreal were struggling with the pale, murky dawn of an autumn morning, and reached the cars on the other side before it was light enough to see objects distinctly. Here the servant, who had been kindly sent with me, left me, and the few hours which were to elapse before I should join my friends seemed to present insurmountable difficulties. The people in the cars were French, the names of the stations were French, and Prenez Garde de la Locomotive denoted the crossings. How the laissez-faire habits of the habitants must be outraged by the clatter of a steam-engine passing their dwellings at a speed of thirty-five miles an hour! Yet these very habitants were talking in the most unconcerned manner in French about a railway accident in Upper Canada, by which forty-eight persons were killed! After a journey of two hours I reached Russe's Point, and entering a handsome steamer on Lake Champlain, took leave of the British dominions. Before re-entering the territory of the Stars and Stripes, I will offer a few concluding remarks on Canada. End of chapter 13. Read by Sibella Denton. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org.
English Woman in America by Isabella Lucy Bird. Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter 14 The increasing interest which attaches to this noble colony fully justifies me in devoting a chapter to a fuller account of its state and capabilities than has yet been given here. Canada extends from Gaspe, on the gulfs of St. Lawrence, to Lake Superior. Its shores are washed by the lakes Huron, Erie, and Ontario, and by the river St. Lawrence as far as the forty-fifth parallel of latitude. From thence the river flows through the centre of the province to the sea. Canada is bounded on the west and south by the Great Lakes and the United States, to the east by New Brunswick and the ocean, and to the north by the Hudson's Bay territory, though its limits in this direction are by no means accurately defined. Canada is but a small portion of the vast tract of country known under the name of British America, the area of which is a ninth part of the globe, and is considerably larger than that of the United States, being 2,630,163,200 acres. Canada contains 19,939,000 occupied acres of land, only 7,300,000 of which are cultivated, and about 137 million acres are still unoccupied. Nearly the whole of this vast territory was originally covered with forests, and from the more distant lumber districts still forms a most profitable article of export, but wherever the land is cleared it is found to be fertile in an uncommon degree. But in the neighborhood of Lake Superior mineral treasures of great value have been discovered to abound. Very erroneous ideas prevail in England on the subject of the Canadian climate. By many persons it is supposed that the country is forever locked in regions of thick-ribbed ice, and that skating and sleighing are favorite summer diversions of the inhabitants. Yet, on the contrary, Lower Canada, or that part of the country nearest to the mouth of the St. Lawrence, has a summer nearly equaling in heat those of tropical climates. Its winter is long and severe, frequently lasting from the beginning of December until April. But if the thermometer stands at thirty-five degrees below zero in January, it marks ninety degrees in the shade in June. In the neighborhood of Quebec the cold is not much exceeded by that within the polar circle, but the dryness of the air is so great that it is now strongly recommended for those of consumptive tendencies. I have seen a wonderful effect produced in the early stages of pulmonary disorders by a removal from the damp, variable climate of Europe to the dry, bracing atmosphere of lower Canada. Spring is scarcely known, the transition from winter to summer is very rapid, but the autumn, or fall, is a long and very delightful season. It is not necessary to dwell further upon the lower Canadian climate, as owing to circumstances hereafter to be explained, few immigrants in any class of life make the lower province more than a temporary resting place. From the eastern coast to the western boundary the variations in climate are very considerable. The peninsula of Canada West enjoys a climate as mild as that of the state of New York. The mean temperature, taken from ten years' observation, was forty-four degrees, and the thermometer rarely falls lower than eleven degrees below zero, while the heat in summer is not oppressive. The peach and vine mature their fruit in the neighborhood of Lake Ontario, and tobacco is very successfully cultivated in the peninsula between Lake Erie and Lake Huron. It seems that Upper Canada, free from the extremes of heat and cold, is intended to receive a European population. Emigrants require to become acclimatized, which they generally are by an attack of og, more or less severe, but the country is extremely healthy, with the exception of occasional visitations of cholera, epidemic diseases are unknown, and the climate is very favorable to the duration of human life. The capabilities of Canada are only now beginning to be appreciated. It has been principally known for its vast exports of timber, but these constitute a very small part of its wealth. By soil and climate, Upper Canada is calculated to afford a vast and annually increasing field for agricultural and pastoral pursuits. Wheat, barley, potatoes, turnips, maize, hops, and tobacco can all be grown in perfection. Canada already exports large quantities of wheat and flour of a very superior description, and it is stated that in no country of the world is there so much wheat grown in proportion to the population and the area under cultivation as in that part of the country west of Kingston. The grain-growing district is almost without limit. 
extending as it does along the St. Lawrence, Lake Erie, and Lake Ontario, to Windsor, with a vast expanse of country to the north and west. The hops, which are an article of recent cultivation, are of very superior quality, and have hitherto been perfectly free from blight. Vast as are the capabilities of Canada for agricultural pursuits, she also offers great facilities for the employment of capital in manufacturing industry, though it is questionable whether it is desirable to divert labor into these channels in a young country where it is dear and scarce. The streams which intersect the land afford an unlimited and very economical source of power, and have already been used to considerable extent. Lower Canada and the shores of the Ottawa afford enormous supplies of white pine, and the districts about Lake Superior contain apparently inexhaustible quantities of ore, which yields a very large percentage of copper. We have thus in Canada about fourteen hundred miles of territory, perhaps the most fertile and productive ever brought under the hands of the cultivator, and as though Providence had especially marked out this portion of the New World as a field for the enterprise of the European races, its natural facilities for transit and communication are nearly unequalled. The Upper Lakes, the St. Lawrence, the Ottawa, and the Saguenay, besides many rivers of lesser note, are so many natural highways for the conveyance of produce of every description, from the most distant parts of the interior to the Atlantic Ocean. Without these natural facilities Canada could never have progressed to the extraordinary extent which she has already done. Great as these advantages are, they have been further increased by British energy and enterprise. By means of ship canals, formed to avoid the obstructions to navigation caused by the rapids of the St. Lawrence, Niagara, and the Sault Ste. Marie, small vessels can load at Liverpool and discharge their cargoes on the most distant shores of Lake Superior. On the Welland Canal alone, which connects Lake Erie with Lake Ontario, the tolls taken in 1853 amounted to more than 65,000 pounds. In the same year, 19,631 passengers and 1,075,218 tons of shipping passed through it. The traffic on the other canals is in like proportion, and is monthly on the increase. But an extensive railway system, to facilitate direct communication with the Atlantic at all seasons of the year, is paving the way for a further and rapid development of the resources of Canada, and for a vast increase in her material prosperity. Already the Great Western Company has formed a line from Windsor, opposite Detroit, U.S., to Toronto, passing through the important towns of Hamilton, London, and Woodstock. A branch also connects Toronto with Lake Simcoe, opening up the very fertile tract of land in that direction. Another railway extends from Fort Erie, opposite Buffalo, to Goderick on Lake Huron, a distance of 158 miles. A portion of the Grand Trunk Railway has recently been opened, and trains now regularly run between Quebec and Montreal, a distance of 186 miles. When this magnificent railway is completed, it will connect the cities of Quebec, Montreal, and Toronto, where, joining the Great Western Scheme, the whole of Upper and Lower Canada will be connected with the Great Lakes and the western states of the neighboring republic. The main line will cross the St. Lawrence at Montreal by a tubular bridge two miles in length. The Grand Trunk Railway will have its eastern terminus at Portland, in the state of Maine, between which city and Liverpool there will be regular weekly communication. This railway is, however, embarrassed by certain financial difficulties, which may retard for a time the completion of the gigantic undertaking. Another railway connects the important city of Ottawa with Prescott, on the river St. Lawrence, and has its terminus opposite to the Ogdensburg station of the Boston Railway. Besides these, there are numerous branches, completed or in course of construction, which will open up the industry of the whole of the interior. Some of these lines, particularly the Great Western, have a large traffic already, and promise to be very successful speculations. The facilities for communication and for the transit of produce are among the most important of the advantages which Canada holds out to emigrants, but there are others which must not be overlooked. The healthiness of the climate has been already remarked upon, but it is an important consideration, as the bracing atmosphere and freedom from diseases allow to the hardy adventurer the free exercise of his vigour and strength. Communication with England is becoming increasingly regular. During the summer months screw-steamers and sailing-vessels ply between Liverpool and Quebec, 
from whence there is a cheap and easy water communication with the districts bordering on the Great Lakes. From Quebec to Windsor, a distance of nearly one thousand miles, passengers are conveyed for the sum of thirty-one shillings, and have the advantage of having their baggage under their eyes during the whole journey. The demand for labour in all parts of Canada West is great and increasing. The wages of farm servants are four pounds per month with board. Day labourers can earn from four to five shillings per diem, and in harvest ten shillings without board. The wages of carpenters and other skilled workmen vary according to their abilities, but they range between seven shillings and twelve shillings sixpence per diem, taking these as the highest and lowest prices. The cost of living is considerably below that in this country, for crockery, cutlery, etc., fifty per cent advance on home retail prices is paid, and for clothing fifty to seventy-five per cent addition on old country prices, if the articles are not of Canadian manufacture. The cost of a comfortable log house with two floors, sixteen feet by twenty-four, is about eighteen pounds, but it must be borne in mind that very little expenditure is needed on the part of the settler. His house and barns are generally built by himself, with the assistance of his neighbours, and a man with the slightest ingenuity or powers of imitation can also fabricate, at a most trifling expense, the few articles of household furniture needed at first. I have been in several log-houses where the bedsteads, tables, and chairs were all the work of the settlers themselves, at a cost, probably, of a few shillings, and though the workmanship was rough, yet the articles answer perfectly well for all practical purposes. Persons of sober, industrious habits, going out as workmen to Canada, speedily acquire comfort and independence. I have seen settlers who went out within the last eight years as day labourers, now the owners of substantial homesteads, with the requisite quantity of farming stock. Canada West is also a most desirable locality for persons of intelligence who are possessed of a small capital. Along the Great Lakes and in the interior there are large tracts of land yet unoccupied. The price of wild land varies from ten shillings to ten pounds per acre, according to the locality. Cleared farms with good buildings in the best townships are worth from between ten pounds to fifteen pounds an acre. These prices refer to the lands belonging to the Canada Land Company. The crowned lands sell at prices varying from four shillings to seven shillings sixpence per acre, but the localities of these lands are not so desirable in most instances. The price of clearing wild lands is about four pounds five shillings per acre, but in many locations, particularly near the railways, the sale of the timber covers the expense of clearing. As has been previously observed, the soil and climate of Upper Canada are favourable to a great variety of crops. Wheat, however, is probably the most certain and profitable, and with respect to cereals and other crops, the produce of the land per acre is not less than in England. In addition to tobacco, flax and hemp are occupying the attention of the settlers, and as an annually increasing amount of capital is employed in factories, these last are likely to prove very profitable. In addition to the capabilities of the soil, Lake Huron and the Georgian Bay present extensive resources in the way of fish, and their borders are peculiarly desirable locations for the emigrant population of the west of Ireland and the west highlands of Scotland. With such very great advantages, it is not surprising that the tide of emigration should set increasingly towards this part of the British dominions. The following is a statement of the number of persons who landed at Quebec during the last five years. The immigration returns for 1855 will probably show a very considerable increase. 1850, 32,000, 292. 1851, 41,076. 1852, 39,176. 1853, 36,699. 1854, 53,183. It may be believed that the greater number of these persons are now enjoying a plenty, many an affluence, which their utmost exertions could not have attained for them at home. Wherever a farmstead, surrounded by well-cleared acres, is seen, it is more than probable that the occupant is also the owner. The value of land increases so rapidly, that persons who originally bought their land in its wild state for four shillings per acre have made handsome fortunes by disposing of it. In Canada the farmer holds a steady and certain position. If he saves money, a hundred opportunities will occur for him to make a profitable investment. 
But if, as is more frequently the case, he is not rich as far as money is concerned, he has all the comforts and luxuries which it could procure. His land is ever increasing in value, and in the very worst seasons, or under accidental circumstances of an unfavorable nature, he can never know real poverty, which is a deficiency in the necessaries of life. But in Canada, as in the old world, people who wish to attain competence or wealth must toil hard for it. In Canada, with all its capabilities and advantages, there is no royal road to riches, no Midas touch to turn everything into gold. The primal curse still holds good, though softened into mercy, and those who emigrate, expecting to work less hard for five shillings a day than at home for one shilling sixpence, will be miserably disappointed, for, where high wages are given, hard work is required. Those must also be disappointed who expect to live in style from off the produce of a small Canadian farm, and those whose imaginary dignity revolts from plough, and spade, and hoe, and those who invest borrowed capital in farming operations. The fields of the slothful in Canada bring forth thorns and thistles, as his fields brought them forth in England. Idleness is absolute ruin, and drunkenness carries with it worse evils than at home, for the practice of it entails a social ostracism, as well as total ruin, upon the immigrant and his family. The same conditions of success are required as in England, honesty, sobriety, and industry. With these, assisted by all the advantages which Canada possesses, although there is always enough of difficulty to moderate the extravagance of exaggerated expectations. The Government of Canada demands a few remarks. Within the last few years the position of this colony, with respect to England, has been greatly changed, by measures which have received the sanction of the Imperial Parliament. In 1847 the Imperial Government abandoned all control over the Canadian tariff, and the colonial legislature now exercises supreme power over customs duties, and all matters of general and local taxation. This was a very important step, and gave a vast impulse to the prosperity of Canada. The colony now has all the advantages, free from a few of the inconveniences, of being an independent country. England retains the right of nominating the Governor-General, and the Queen has the power, rarely, if ever exercised, of putting a veto upon certain acts of the colonial legislature. England conducts all matters of war and diplomacy, and provides a regular military establishment for the defense of Canada, and, though she is neither required to espouse our quarrels, or bear any portion of our burdens, we should be compelled to espouse hers in any question relating to her honor or integrity, at a lavish expenditure of blood and treasure. It appears that the present relations in which Canada stands to England are greatly to her advantage, and there is happily no desire on her part to sever them. The Governor-General is appointed by the Crown, generally for a term of five years, but is paid by the province. He acts as Viceroy, and his assent to the measures of the legislature is required, in order to render them valid. His executive council, composed of the ministers of the day, is analogous to our English cabinet. The governor, like our own sovereign, must bow to the will of a majority in the legislature, and dismiss his ministers when they lose the confidence of that body. The second estate is the legislative council. The governor, with the advice of his ministry, appoints the members of this body. They are chosen for life, and their number is unrestricted. At present there are about forty members." The functions of this council are very similar to those of our House of Lords, and consist, to a great extent, in registering the decrees of the lower house. The third estate is denominated the House of Assembly, and consists of 130 members, or 65 for each province. The qualification for the franchise has been placed tolerably high, and no doubt wisely, as in the absence of a better guarantee for the right use of it, a property qualification, however trifling in amount, has a tendency to elevate the tone of electioneering, and to enhance the value which is attached to a vote. The qualification for electors is a fifty-pound freehold, or an annual rent of seven pounds ten shillings. Contrary to the practice in the States, where large numbers of the more respectable portion of the community abstain from voting, in Canada the votes are nearly all recorded at every election, and the fact that the franchise is within the reach of every sober man gives an added stimulus to industry. The attempt to establish British constitutional government on the soil of the New World is an interesting experiment, and has yet to be tested. 
there are various disturbing elements in Canada, of which we have little experience in England, the principal one being the difficulty of legislating between what, in spite of the Union, are two distinct nations, of different races and religions. The impossibility of reconciling the rival and frequently adverse claims of the upper and lower provinces has become a very embarrassing question. The strong social restraints, and the generally high tone of public feeling in England, which exercise a powerful control over the minister of the day, do not at present exist in Canada. Neither has the public mind that nice perception of moral truth which might be desired. The population of Upper Canada, more especially, has been gathered from many parts of the earth, and is composed of men, generally speaking, without education, whose sole aim is the acquisition of wealth, and who are not cemented by any common ties of nationality. Under these circumstances, and bearing in mind the immense political machinery in which the papacy can set to work in Canada, the transfer of British institutions to the colony must at present remain a matter of problematical success. It is admitted that the failure of representative institutions arises from the unworthiness of constituencies, and if the efforts which are made by means of education to elevate the character of the next generation of electors should prove fruitless, it is probable that, with the independence of the colony, American institutions, with their objectionable features, would follow. At present the great difficulties to be surmounted lie in the undue power possessed by the French Roman Catholic population, and the Romanist influences brought to bear successfully on the government. There is in Canada no direct taxation for national purposes, except a mere trifle for the support of the provincial lunatic asylums, and for some other public buildings. The provincial revenue is derived from customs duties, public works, crown lands, excise, and bank impost. The customs duties last year came in to one million one hundred thousand pounds, the revenue from public works to one hundred twenty three thousand pounds, from lands about the same sum, from excise about forty thousand pounds, and from the tax on the current notes of the banks thirty thousand pounds. Every county, township, or town, or incorporated village elects its own council, and all local objects are provided for by direct taxation through these bodies. In these municipalities the levying of the local taxes is vested, and they administer the monies collected for roads, bridges, schools, and improvements, and the local administration of public justice. According to the census taken in 1851, the population of Upper Canada was 952,000, being an increase since 1842 of 465,945. That of Lower Canada amounted to 890,000, making a total of 1,842,000, but if to this we add the number of persons who have immigrated within the last four years, we have a population of 2,012,134. Of the population of Lower Canada, 669,000 are of French origin. These people speak the French language and profess the Romish faith. The land is divided into seigneuries, there are feudal customs and antiquated privileges, and the laws are based upon the model of those of old France. The progress of Lower Canada is very tardy. The French have never made good colonists, and the Romish religion acts as a drag upon social and national progress. The habitants of the Lower Province, though moral and amiable, are not ambitious, and hold their ancient customs with a tenacity which opposes itself to their advancement. The various changes in the tariff made by the imperial government affected Lower Canada very seriously. On comparing the rate of increase in the population of the two provinces in the same period of twelve years, we find that for Upper Canada it was 130 per cent, for Lower Canada only 34 per cent. The disparity between the population and the wealth of the two provinces is annually on the increase. The progress of Upper Canada is something perfectly astonishing, and bids fair to rival, if not exceed, that of her gigantic neighbour. Her communication between the Lake District and the Atlantic is practically more economical, taking the whole of the year, and, as British emigration has tended chiefly to the Upper Province, the population is of a more homogeneous character than that of the States. The climate also is more favourable than that of Lower Canada. These circumstances, combined with the inherent energy of the Anglo-Saxon races which have principally colonized it, account in great measure for the vast increase in the material prosperity of the upper province as compared with the lower. In 1830 the population of Upper Canada was 210,000 souls. 
In 1842, 486,000, and in 1851 it had reached 952,000. Its population is now supposed to exceed that of Lower Canada by 300,000. It increased in nine years about 100 per cent. In addition to the large number of emigrants who have arrived by way of Quebec, it has received a considerable accession of population from the United States. 7,000 persons crossed the frontier in 1854. The increase of its wealth is far more than commensurate with that of its population. The first returns of the accessible property of Upper Canada were taken in 1825, and its amount was estimated at 1,855,000 pounds. In 1845 it was estimated at 6,393,000 pounds, but in seven years after this, in 1852, it presents the astonishing amount of 37,696,000 pounds. The wheat crop of Upper Canada in 1841 was 3,222,000 bushels, and in 1851 it was 12,693,000, but the present year, 1855, will show a startling and almost incredible increase. In addition to the wealth gained in the cultivation of the soil, the settlers are seizing upon the vast water-power which the country affords, and are turning it to the most profitable purposes. Sawmills, grist mills, and woolen mills start up in every direction, in addition to tool and machinery factories, iron foundries, asheries, and tanneries. Towns are everywhere springing up as if by magic along the new lines of railway and canal, and the very villages of Upper Canada are connected by the electric telegraph. The value of land is everywhere increasing as new lines of communication are formed. The town of London, in Upper Canada, presents a very remarkable instance of rapid growth. It is surrounded by a very rich agricultural district, and the Great Western Railway passes through it. Seven years ago this place was a miserable-looking town of between two and three thousand inhabitants. Now it is a flourishing town, alive with business, and has a population of thirteen thousand souls. The increase in the value of property in its vicinity will appear almost incredible to English readers, but it is stated, on the best authority, a building site sold in September 1855, for one hundred and fifty pounds per foot, which ten years ago could have been bought for that price per acre, and ten years earlier for as many pence. In Upper Canada there appears to be at the present time very little of that state of society which is marked by hard struggles and lawless excesses. In every part of my travels west of Toronto I found a high degree of social comfort, security, to life and property, the means for education and religious worship, and all the accessories of a high state of civilization, which are the advances brought into every locality almost simultaneously with the clearing of the land. Yet it is very apparent, even to the casual visitor, that the progress of Canada West has only just begun. No limits can be assigned to its future prosperity, and as its capabilities become more known, increasing numbers of stout hearts and strong arms will be attracted towards it. The immense resources of the soil under cultivation have not yet been developed. The settlers are prodigal of land, and a great portion of the occupied territory, destined to bear the most luxuriant crops, is still in bush. The magnificent districts adjoining Lake Huron, the Georgian Bay, and Lake Simcoe, are only just being brought into notice, and of the fertile valley of the Ottawa, which it is estimated would support a population of nine millions, very little is known. Every circumstance that can be brought forward combines to show that Upper Canada is destined to become a great, a wealthy, and a prosperous country. The census gives some interesting tables relating to the origins of the inhabitants of Canada. I wish that I had space to present my readers with the whole, instead of with this brief extract. Canadians, French origin, 695,000. Canadians, English origin, 651,000. England and Wales, 93,000. Scotland, 90,000. Ireland, 227,000. United States, 56,000. Germany, 10,000. Besides these, there are 8,000 colored persons and 14,000 Indians in Canada, and emigrants from every civilized country in the world. As far as regards the Church of England, Canada is divided into three dioceses, Toronto, Montreal, and Quebec, with a prospect of the creation of a fourth, that of Kingston. The clergy, whose duties are very arduous and ill-requited, have been paid by the Society for Propagating the Gospel, and out of the proceeds of the clergy reserves. 
the society has in great measure withdrawn its support and recent legislative enactments have a tendency to place the church of england in canada to some extent on the voluntary system the inhabitants of canada are fully able to support any form of worship to which they may choose to attach themselves trinity college at toronto is in close connection with the church of england the Roman Catholics have enormous endowments, including a great part of the island of Montreal, and several valuable seigneuries. Very large sums are also received by them from those who enter the convents, and for baptisms, burials, and masses for the dead. The enslaving, enervating, and retarding effects of Roman Catholicism are nowhere better seen than in Lower Canada, where the priests exercise despotic authority. They have numerous and wealthy conventual establishments, both at Quebec and Montreal, and several Jesuit and other seminaries. The Irish immigrants constitute the great body of Romanists in Upper Canada. In the lower province there are more than 746,000 adherents to this faith. The Presbyterians are a very respectable, influential, and important body in Canada, bound firmly together by their uniformity of worship and doctrine. Through an Episcopalian form of church government, and a form of worship are as obnoxious to them as at home, their opposition seldom amounts to hostility. Generally speaking, they are very friendly in their intercourse with the zealous and hard-working clergy of the Church of England, and, indeed, the comparative absence of sectarian feeling, and the way in which the ministers of all denominations act in harmonious combination for the general good, is one of the most pleasing features connected with religion in Canada. In Upper Canada there are 1,559 churches for 952,000 adherents, being one place of worship for every 612 inhabitants. Of these, 226 are Church of England, 135 to Roman Catholics, 148 to the Presbyterians, and 471 to the Methodists. In Lower Canada there are 610 churches for 890,000 adherents, 746,000 of whom are Roman Catholics. There is, therefore, in the lower province one place of worship for every 1,459 inhabitants. These religious statistics furnish additional proof of the progress of Upper Canada. The numbers adhering to the five most important denominations are as follows. Roman Catholics, 914,000. Episcopalians, 268,000. Presbyterians, 237,000. Methodists, 183,000. Baptists, 49,000. Besides these, there are more than twenty sects, some of them holding the most extravagant and fanatical tenets. In the lower province there are forty-five thousand persons belonging to the Church of England, thirty-three thousand are Presbyterians, and seven hundred forty-six thousand are Roman Catholics. With this vast number of Romanists in Canada, it is not surprising that under the present system of representation, which gives an equal number of representatives to each province, irrespective of population, the Roman Catholics should exercise a very powerful influence on the colonial parliament. More importance is attached generally to education in Upper Canada than might have been supposed from the extreme deficiencies of the first settlers. A national system of education, on a most liberal scale, has been organized by the legislature, which presents, in unfavorable contrast, the feeble and isolated efforts made for this object by private benevolence in England. Acting on the principle that the first duty of government is to provide for the education of its subjects, a uniform and universal educational system has been put into force in Canada. This system of public instruction is founded on the cooperation of the executive government with the local municipalities. The members of these cooperations are elected by the freeholders and householders. The system, therefore, is strictly popular and national, as the people voluntarily tax themselves for its support, and through their elected trustees manage the schools themselves. It is probable that the working of this plan may exercise a beneficial influence on the minds of the people, in training them to thought for their offspring, as regards their best interest. No compulsion whatever is exercised by the legislature over the proceedings of the local municipalities. It merely offers a pecuniary grant, on the condition of local exertion. The children of every class of the population have equal access to these schools, and there is no compulsion upon the religious face of any. There are in Upper Canada 3,127 common schools, about 1,800 of which are free, or partially free. The total amount available for school purposes in 1853 amounted to nearly 200,000 pounds, a magnificent sum, considering the youth and comparatively thin population of the country. The total number of pupils in the same year was 194,000. 
But though this number appears large, the painful fact must also be stated that there were seventy-nine thousand children destitute of the blessings of education of any kind. The whole number of teachers at the same period was thirty-five hundred thirty-nine. The inspection of schools, which is severe and systematic, is conducted by local superintendents appointed by the different municipalities. There is a board of public instruction in each county for the examination and licensing of teachers. The standard of their qualifications is fixed by provincial authority. At the head of the whole are a council of public instruction and a chief commissioner of schools, both appointed by the Crown. There are several colleges, very much on the system of the Scotch universities, including Trinity College at Toronto, in connection with the Church of England, and Knox's College, a Presbyterian theological seminary. There are also medical colleges, both in Upper and Lower Canada, and a chair of agriculture has been established at University College, Toronto. From these statements it will be seen that, from the ample provision made, a good education can be obtained at a very small cost. There are in Lower Canada upwards of eleven hundred schools. Every town, and I believe I may with truth write every village, has its daily and weekly papers, advocating all shades of political opinion. The press in Canada is the medium through which the people receive, first by telegraphic dispatch and later in full, every item of English intelligence brought by the bi-weekly mails. Taking the newspapers as a whole, they are far more gentlemanly in their tone than those of the neighbouring republic, and perhaps are not more abusive and personal than some of our English provincial papers. There is, however, very great room for improvement, and no doubt, as the national palate becomes improved by education, the morsels presented to it will be more choice. Quebec, Montreal, and Toronto have, each of them, several daily papers, but, as far as I am aware, no paper openly professes republicanism or annexationist views, and some of the journals advocate, in the strongest manner, an attachment to British institutions. The prices of these papers vary from a penny to threepence each, and a workman would as soon think of depriving himself of his breakfast as of his morning journal. It is stated that thousands of the subscribers to the newspapers are so illiterate as to depend upon their children for a knowledge of their contents. At present few people, comparatively speaking, are more than half educated. The knowledge of this fact lowers the tone of the press, and circumscribes both authors and speakers, as any allusions to history or general literature would be very imperfectly, if at all, understood. The merchants and lawyers of Canada have, if of British extraction, generally received a sound and useful education, which, together with the admirable way in which they keep pace with the politics and literature of Europe, enables them to pass very creditably in any society. There are very good bookstores in Canada, particularly at Toronto, where the best English works are to be purchased for little more than half the price which is paid for them at home, and these are largely read by the educated Canadians, who frequently possess excellent libraries. Cheap American novels, often of a very objectionable tendency, are largely circulated among the lower classes, but to provide them with literature of a better character, large libraries have been formed by local efforts. Assisted by Government Grants Canada, as yet, possesses no literature of her own, and the literary man is surrounded by difficulties. Independently of the heavy task of addressing himself to uneducated minds, unable to appreciate depth of thought and beauty of language, it is not likely that, where the absorbing passion is the acquisition of wealth, much encouragement would be given to the struggles of native talent. Canada, young as she is, has made great progress in the mechanical arts, and some of her machinery and productions make a very creditable show at the Paris exhibition. But it must be borne in mind that this is due to the government, rather than to the enterprise of private exhibitors. Taken together, there is perhaps no country in the world so prosperous or so favoured as Canada, after giving full weight to the disadvantages which she possesses, in an unsettled state of society and a mixed and imperfectly educated people. It is the freest land under the sun, acknowledging neither a despotic sovereign nor a tyrant populace. Life and property are alike secure. Liberty has not yet degenerated into lawlessness. The Constitution combines the advantages of the monarchical and republican forms of government. The Legislative Assembly, to a great extent, represents the people. Religious toleration is enjoyed in the fullest degree. Taxation and debt, which cripple the energies and excite the disaffectation of older communities, are unfelt. The slave flying from bondage in the South knows no sense of liberty or security till he finds both on the banks of the St. Lawrence, under the shadow of the British flag. 
Free from the curse of slavery, Canada has started untrammeled in the race of nations, and her progress already bids fair to outstrip in rapidity that of her older and gigantic neighbour. Labour is what she requires, and as if to meet that requirement, circumstances have directed the attention of emigrants towards her. The young, the enterprising, and the vigorous are daily leaving the wasted shores of Scotland and Ireland for her fertile soil, where the laws of England shall protect them, and her flag shall still wave over them. Large numbers of persons are now leaving the northeast of Scotland for Canada, and these are among the most valuable of the immigrants who seek her shores. They carry with them the high moral sense, the integrity and the loyalty which characterize them at home, and in many cases, more than this, the religious principle and godliness which has the promise of life which now is, and of that which is to come. Taken as a whole, the inhabitants of both provinces are attached to England and England's rule. They receive the news of our reverses with sorrow, and our victories create bursts of enthusiasm from the shores of the St. Lawrence to those of Lake Superior. As might be expected, the Anglo-French alliance is extremely popular. To show the sympathy of Canada, the legislature made the munificent grant of twenty thousand pounds to be divided between the patriotic funds of both nations, and every township and village has contributed to swell a further sum of thirty thousand pounds to be applied to the same object. The imperial garrisons in Canada have recently been considerably diminished, and with perfect safety. The efforts of agitators to produce disaffectation have signally failed, and it is stated by those best acquainted with the temper of the people that Canada will not become a separate country, except by England's voluntary act. At present every obstacle to her further development seems to be removed. Her constitution has been remodelled within the last few years on an enlarged and liberal basis. Her religious endowments have been placed on a permanent footing. All the points likely to cause a rupture with the United States have been amicably settled, and important commercial advantages have been obtained. The sun of prosperity shines upon her from the Gulf of St. Lawrence to the distant shores of the Ottawa and the western lakes. She requires, only for the future, the blessings of God, so freely accorded to the nations which honour him, to make her great and powerful. The future of nations, as of individuals, is mercifully veiled in mystery. We can trace the rise and progress of empires, but we know not the time when they shall droop and decay, when the wealthy and populous cities of the present shall be numbered with the Nineveh and Babylon of the past. It may be that in future years our mighty nation shall go the way of all that have been before it, but whether the wise decrees of Providence doom it to flourish or decline, we can still look with confident hope to this noble colony in the new world, believing that on her enlightened and happy shores, under the influence of beneficent institutions and of a scriptural faith, the Anglo-Saxon race may renew the vigour of its youth, and realise in time to come the brightest hopes which have been formed of England in the New World. End of chapter 14. Read by Sibella Denton. For more information, please visit LibriVox.org. Fifteen of the English Woman in America by Isabella Lucy Bird, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter Fifteen. It has been truly observed that a reliable book on the United States yet remains to be written. The writer of such a volume must neither be a tourist nor a temporary resident. He must spend years in the different states, nicely estimating the different characteristics of each, as well as the broadly marked shades of difference between East, West, and South. He must trace the effect of Republican principles upon the various races which form this vast community, and while analyzing the prosperity of the country, he must carefully distinguish between the real, the fictitious, and the speculative. In England we speak of America as Brother Jonathan, in the singular number, without any fraternal feeling, however, and consider it as one nation, possessing uniform distinguishing characteristics. I saw less difference between Edinburgh and Boston than between Boston and Chicago. The dark-haired Celts of the west of Scotland, and the stirring artisans of our manufacturing cities, have more in common than the descendants of the Puritans in New England, and the reckless, lawless inhabitants of the newly settled territories west of the Mississippi. It must not be forgotten that the thirty-two states of which the Union is composed may be considered in some degree as separate countries, each possessing its governor and assembly, and framing, to a considerable extent, its own laws. 
Beyond the voice which each state possesses in the Congress and Senate at Washington, there is, apparently, little to bind this vast community together. There is no national form of religion, or state-endowed church. Unitarianism may be the prevailing faith in one state, Presbyterianism in another, and Universalism in a third, while between the northern and southern states there is as wide a difference as between England and Russia, a difference stamped on the very soil itself, and which, in the opinion of some, threatens a disseverance of the Union. Other causes also produce highly distinctive features in the inhabitants. In the long-settled districts bordering upon the Atlantic, all the accomplishments and appliances of civilization may be met with, and a comparatively stationary, refined, and intellectual condition of society. Travel for forty hours to the westward, and everything is in a transitional state. There are rough roads and unfinished railroads, foundations of cities laid in soil scarcely cleared from the forest, splendid hotels within sound of the hunter's rifle and the lumberer's axe, while the elements of society are more chaotic than the features of the country. Every year a tide of emigration rolls westward, not from Europe only, but from the crowded eastern cities, forming a tangled web of races, manners, and religions, which the hasty observer cannot attempt to disentangle. Yet there are many external features of uniformity which the traveller cannot fail to lay hold of, and which go under the general name of Americanisms. These are peculiarities of dress, manners, and phraseology, and to some extent of opinion, and may be partly produced by the locomotive life which the American leads, and the way in which all classes are brought into contact in travelling. These peculiarities are not to be found among the highest or the highly educated classes, but they force themselves upon the tourist to a remarkable, and frequently to a repulsive extent, and it is safer for him to narrate facts and comment upon externals, though in doing so he presents a very partial and superficial view of the people, than to present his readers with general inferences, drawn from partial premises, or with conclusions based upon imperfect and often erroneous data. An entire revolution had been effected in my way of looking at things since I landed on the shores of the New World. I had ceased to look for vestiges of the past, or for relics of ancient magnificence, and in place of these I now contemplated vast resources in a state of progressive and almost feverish development, and having become accustomed to a general absence of the picturesque, had learned to look at the practical and the utilitarian with a high degree of interest and pleasure. The change from the lethargy and feudalism of Lower Canada and the gaiety of Quebec to the activity of the New England population was very startling. It was not less so from the reposeful manners and gentlemanly appearance of the English Canadians, and the vivacity and politeness of the French, to Yankee dress, twang, and peculiarities. These appeared, as the Americans say, in full blast during the few hours which I spent on Lake Champlain. There were about a hundred passengers, including a sprinkling of the fairer sex. The amusements were story-telling, whittling, and smoking. Fully half the stories told began with, There was a cute coon down east, and the burden of nearly all was some clever act of cheating, sucking a greenhorn, as the phrase is. There were occasional anecdotes of bustings up on the southern rivers, making tracks from importunate creditors, of practical jokes and glaring impositions. There was a great deal of liquoring up going on the whole time. The best story-teller was repeatedly called upon to liquor some, which was accordingly done by copious draughts of ginsling, but at last he declared he was a gone coon, fairly stumped, by which he meant to express that he was tired and could do no more. This assertion was met by encouragements to pile on, upon which the individual declared that he couldn't get his steam up, he was tired some. This word some is synonymous in its youth with our word rather, or its Yankee equivalent, kinder. On this occasion some one applied it to the boat, which he declared was almighty dirty, and shaky some, a great libel, by the way. The dress of these individuals somewhat amused me. The prevailing costumes of the gentlemen were straw hats, black dress-coats remarkably shiny, tight pantaloons, and pumps. These were worn by the sallow narrators of the tales of successful roguery. There were a few hardy western men, habited in scarlet flannel shirts, and trousers tucked into high boots their garments supported by stout leathern belts, with dependent bowie knives. These told yarns of adventures and dangers from Indians, something in the style of Colonel Crockett. The ladies wore their satin or kid shoes of various colours, of which the mud had made woeful havoc. The stories, which called forth the applause of the company in exact proportion to the barefaced roguery and utter want of principle displayed in each, 
would not have been worth listening to, had it not been from the extraordinary vernacular in which they were clothed, and the racy and emphatic manner of the narrators. Some of these voted three legs of their chairs superfluous, and balanced themselves on the fourth, while others hooked their feet on the top of the windows, and balanced themselves on the back legs of their chairs, in a position strongly suggestive of hanging by the heels. One of the stories, which excited the most amusement, reads very tamely divested of the slang and manner of the storyteller. A cute chap down east had a two-fifty black mare, one which could perform a mile in two minutes and fifty seconds, and being about to make tracks, he sold her to a gentleman for three hundred and fifty dollars. In the night he stole her, cut her tail, painted her legs white, gave her a blaze on the face, sold her for a hundred dollars, and decamped sending a note to the first purchaser acquainting him with the particulars of the transaction. Cute chap, that. A wide-awake feller. That coon had cut his eye teeth. A smart sell, that, were the comments made on this roguish transaction, all the sympathy of the listeners being on the side of the rogue. The stories related by Barnum of the tricks and impositions practised by himself and others are a fair sample, so far as roguery goes, of those which are to be heard in hotels, steamboats, and cars. I have heard men openly boast, before a miscellaneous company, of acts of dishonesty which in England would have procured him transportation for them. Mammon is the idol which the people worship, the one desire is the acquisition of money, the most nefarious trickery and bold dishonesty are invested with a spurious dignity, if they act as aids to the attainment of this object. Children, from their earliest years, imbibe the idea that sin is sin only when found out. The breakfast-bell rang, and a general rush took place, and I was left alone with two young ladies, who had just become acquainted, and were resolutely bent upon finding out each other's likes and dislikes, with the intention of vowing an eternal friendship. A gentleman who looked as if he had come out of a ballroom came up, and with a profusion of bows addressed them, or the prettiest of them, thus, "'Miss, it's feeding time, I guess. What will you eat? You're very polite. What's the ticket? Chicken and corn fixings, and pork with onion fixings.' "'Well, I'm hungry some. I'll have some pig and fixings.' The swain retired, and brought a profusion of viands, which elicited the remark, "'Well, I guess that's substantial anyhow.' The young lady's appetite seemed to be very good, for I heard the observation, "'Well, you eat considerable. You're in full blast, I guess.' "'Guess I am. It's all fired cold, and I have been an everlasting long time off my feed.' A long, undertoned conversation followed this interchange of civilities, when I heard the lady say, in rather elevated tones, "'You're trying to rile me some. You're piling it on a trifle too high.' "'Well, I did want to put up your dander. Do tell now, where was you raised?' "'In Kentucky. I could have guessed that. Wherever I sees a splendiferous gal, a kinder, gentler goer, and a high stepper, I says to myself, "'That gal's from old Kentuck, and no mistake.' This couple carried on a long conversation in the same style of graceful bandage, but I have given enough of it. Lake Champlain is extremely pretty, though it is on rather too large a scale to please an English eye, being about one hundred and fifty miles long. The shores are gentle slopes, wooded and cultivated, with the green mountains of Vermont in the background. There was not a ripple on the water, and the morning was so warm and showery that I could have believed it to be an April day, had not the leafless trees told another tale. Whatever the boasted beauties of Lake Champlain were, they veiled themselves from English eyes in a thick fog, through which we steamed at half speed, with a dismal fog-bell incessantly tolling. I landed at Burlington, a thriving modern town, prettily situated below some wooded hills, on a bay, the margin of which is pure white sand. Here, as at nearly every town, great and small, in the United States, there was an excellent hotel. No people have such confidence in the future as the Americans. You frequently find a splendid hotel surrounded by a few clapboard houses, and may feel inclined to smile at the incongruity. The builder looks into futurity, and sees that in two years a thriving city will need hotel accommodation, and seldom is he wrong. The American is a gregarious animal, and it is not impossible that an hotel, with a table d'hote, may act as a magnet. Here I joined Mr. and Mrs. Alderson, and travelled with them to Albany, through Vermont and New York. The country was hilly, and more suited for sheep farming than for corn. Water privileges were abundant in the shape of picturesque torrents, and numerous mills turned their capabilities to profitable account. Our companions were rather of a low description, many of them Germans, and desperate tobacco-chewers. The whole floor of the car was covered with streams of tobacco-juice, apple-cores, grape-skins, and chestnut-husks. 
We crossed the Hudson River and spent the night at de Laval's at Albany. The great peculiarity of this most comfortable hotel is that the fifty waiters are Irish girls, neatly and simply dressed. They are under a coloured manager, and their civility and alacrity made me wonder that the highly paid services of male waiters were not more frequently dispensed with. The railway ran along the street in which the hotel is situated. From my bedroom window I looked down into the funnel of a locomotive, and all night long was serenaded with screams, ringing of bells, and cries of all aboard, and go ahead. Albany, the capital of the state of New York, is one of the prettiest towns in the Union. The slope on which it is built faces the Hudson, and is crowned by a large state-house, the place of meeting for the legislature of the Empire State. The Americans repudiate the centralization principle, and for wise reasons, of which the Irish form a considerable number, they almost invariably locate the government of each state, not at the most important or populous town, but at some inconsiderable place, where the learned legislators are not in danger of having their embarrassments increased by deliberating under the coercion of a turbulent urban population. Albany has several public buildings, and a number of conspicuous churches, and is a very thriving place. The traffic on the river between it and New York is enormous. There is a perpetual stream of small vessels up and down. The Empire City receives its daily supplies of vegetables, meat, butter, and eggs from its neighborhood. The Erie and Champlain canals here meet the Hudson, and, through the former, the produce of the teeming west pours into the Atlantic. The traffic is carried in small sailing sloops and steamers. Sometimes a little screw vessel of fifteen or twenty tons may be seen to hurry, puffing and panting, up to a large vessel, and drag it down to the sea, but generally one paddle-tug takes six vessels down, four being towed behind, and one or two lashed on either side. As both steamers and sloops are painted white, and the sails are perfectly dazzling in their purity, and twenty, thirty, and forty of these flotillas may be seen in the course of a morning, the Hudson River presents a very animated and unique appearance. It is said that everybody loses a portmanteau at Albany. I was more fortunate, and left it without having experienced the slightest annoyance. On the other side of the ferry a very undignified scramble takes place for the seats on the right side of the cars, as the scenery for one hundred and thirty miles is perfectly magnificent. Go ahead, rapidly succeeded all aboard, and we whizzed along this most extraordinary line of railway, so prolific in accidents that, when people leave New York by it, their friends frequently request them to notify their safe arrival at their destination. It runs along the very verge of the river, below a steep cliff, but often is supported just above the surface of the water upon a wooden platform. Guide-books inform us that the trains which run on this line, and the steamers which ply on the Hudson, are equally unsafe, the former from collisions and upsets, the latter from bustings up. But most people prefer the boats, from the advantage of seeing both sides of the river. The sun of a November morning had just risen as I left Albany, and in a short time beaming upon swelling hills, green savannas, and waving woods fringing the margin of the Hudson. At Coxsackie the river expands into a small lake, and the majestic Catskill Mountains rise abruptly from the western side. The scenery among these mountains is very grand and varied. Its silence and rugged sublimity recall the old world. It has rocky pinnacles and desert passes, inaccessible eminences and yawning chasms. The world might grow populous at the feet of the Catskills, but it would leave them untouched and unprofaned in their stern majesty. From this point, for a hundred miles, the eyes of the traveller are perfectly steeped in beauty, which, gathering and increasing, culminates at West Point, a lofty eminence jutting upon a lake apparently without any outlet. The spurs of mountain ranges which meet here project in precipices from five to fifteen hundred feet in height. Trees find a place for their roots in every rift among the rocks. Festoons of clematis and wild vine hang in graceful drapery from base to summit, and the dark mountain shadows loom over the lake-like expanse below. The hand wearies of riding the loveliness of this river. I saw it on a perfect day. The Indian summer lingered, as, though unwilling, that chilly blasts of winter should blight the loveliness of this beauteous scene. The gloom of autumn was not there, but its glories were on every leaf and twig. The bright scarlet of the maple vied with the brilliant berries of the rowan, and from among the tendrils of the creepers, which were waving in the sighs of the west wind, peeped forth the deep crimson of the sumac. There were very few signs of cultivation. The banks of the Hudson are barren in all but beauty. The river is a succession of small wild lakes, 
connected by narrow reaches, bound for ever between abrupt precipices. There are lakes more beauteous than Loch Katrine, softer in their features than Loch Achre, though, like both, or like the waters which glitter beneath the blue sky of Italy. Along their margins the woods hung in scarlet and gold. High above towered the purple peaks. The blue waters flashed back the rays of a sun shining from an unclouded sky. The air was warm, like June, and, I think, the sunbeams of that day scarcely shone upon a fairer scene. At midday the highlands of Hudson were left behind. The mountains melted into hills, the river expanded into a noble stream about a mile wide, the scarlet woods, the silvery lakes, and the majestic Catskills faded away in the distance, and with a whoop and a roar and a clatter the cars entered into, and proceeded at slackened speed down, a long street called Tenth Avenue, among carts, children, and pigs. True enough, we were in New York, the western receptacle not only of the traveller and the energetic merchant, but of the destitute, the friendless, the vagabond, and, in short, of all the outpourings of Europe, who here form a conglomerate mass of evil, making America responsible for their vices and their crimes. Yet the usual signs of approach to an enormous city were a-wanting, dwarfed trees, market-gardens, cockney arbours, in which citizens smoke their pipes in the evening, and imagine themselves in Arcadia, rows of small houses, and a murky canopy of smoke. We had steamed down Tenth Avenue for two or three miles, when we came to a standstill where several streets meet. The train was taken to pieces, and to each car four horses or mules were attached, which took us for some distance into the very heart of the town, racing, apparently, with omnibuses and carriages, till at last we were deposited in Chambers Street, not in a station, or even under cover, be it observed. My baggage, or plunder, as it is termed, had been previously disposed of, but while waiting with my head disagreeably near to a horse's nose, I saw people making distracted attempts, and futile ones, as it appeared, to preserve their effects from the clutches of numerous porters, many of them probably thieves. To judge from appearances, many people would mourn the loss of their portmanteaus that night. New York deserves the name applied to Washington, the city of magnificent distances. I drove in a hack for three miles to my destination, along crowded, handsome streets, but I believe that I only traversed a third part of the city. It possesses the features of many different lands, but it has characteristics peculiarly its own, and, as with suburbs, it may almost bear the name of the million-peopled city, and its growing influence and importance have earned it the name of the Empire City. I need not apologize for dwelling at some length upon it in the succeeding chapter. End of chapter 15 Read by Sibella Denton for more information, please visit LibriVox.org.